the online industry grew the market, and that's for John and for, for Richard and for, for Mike. Well, ironically, it, 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 uh, in terms of the fear, there was uh, equally a fear that when online poker, for example, came in, po poker rooms, again, Hollywood example, would close down. In fact, many did. It, you know, the early 2000s wasn't a, a great time for poker. But funny enough, online poker has actually regenerated the retail market sure. because, and, and it's actually quite reassuring for retail businesses, the fact that even though online poker is fantastic and it's become a huge marketplace, that desire of people to actually interact with real people, so it creates a whole generation of, of new young players playing online, um, the poker practices. Uh, and, and uh, flatteringly called in some cases these great guys, mathematical experts. Uh, but when it then came to uh, you know, taking their skills further, they wanted to play against real people. And so the World Series, as I'm sure mm -hmm. uh, people know, you know, suddenly the table in the final was full of people who'd qualified online. It was a bit of a culture shock in terms of the old lag players, the Amarillo Slim Simple, he's one of our characters whose skill was based on reading the tells of people's faces, but these guys, you know, with their headphones and their baseball caps, not even looking at the other guy because they're, they're almost playing a mathematical game, completely changed the culture, but they want to still play in a live environment. So our, our uh, poker rooms have become far more successful, and I don't think it's just because of a desire from people to play retail poker generally. It's kind of created that marketplace from people who have played online because the fear by reverse, that sort of horror of playing against uh, 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 you know, these sharky people in, on a poker table who you know, you've never played before and you've got to go and sit down in a room with them, playing online is a much safer environment to actually learn your skill without feeling intimidated. But once you've got those skills, then you want to go and take them on in the flesh. And as I said, it's encouraging to know that people still want that interaction and I think it's therefore good for the business in, in that way and therefore we can work very happily side by side. And said from uh, poker, I think is a very good example of that, of, of um, how one is bred the other or, or regenerated the other. So. John, do you think that applies to the casino world as well, to people uh, come online that when they're of age and then learn to play blackjack and roulette and baccarat? And I'm, not, I'm, not so sure, I'm not so sure it does, to be honest. I think our experience um, certainly mirrors that of Richard. Um, once our managers accept the fact that our customers are playing online and that they may as well, if they're going to play online, they may as well play online with us. That has been the turning point in, in gaining that understanding and being able to bring customers um, to, to play with us online. Uh, you asked the question earlier about whether the, the, the management skills transfer. Right. My, my personal view is that they're actually very different businesses. Mm. Um, a, a true online casino is essentially, it's marketing, it, it's purely a marketing business. You, you get the marketing right, you have the process, you have the search engine optimization. Uh, you put something in the top and you'll get your percentage out the bottom. Um, totally different skills to operating an actual land-based casino. Well, then, I mean, then, then let me ask you, you're absolutely right, different skill sets, but clearly by operating an online and a land-based casino, uh, you would think that someone who has both sides of the equation should have a huge advantage over someone who's only online or indeed someone who's only land-based. Uh, yeah, just I'd in like terms to, of assets. I'd like to address that. Yeah, why, why, why haven't we seen uh, <laughs> land-based casinos that are going online more heavily leverage the land-based casino? I mean, you mentioned earlier handing out uh, those little um, handing out CDs for uh, for um, well, Stanley Bet, wasn't it? Yeah. And um, in the casinos, or maybe Ladbrokes handing out CDs from from Ladbrokes. But why haven't we seen more of that? Why haven't we seen the land-based asset more leveraged? in order to get more value out of the, the online? I, I, I truly believe it, it, it's out of proportion to the land-based business. So to, to get the cut through online, you would have to spend, say, 50, 60 million annually on TV advertising to get the cut through, to get the business, to, to take on one of the big current operators. Uh, for a, for a land-based casino, that well, it's a different business. Um, the, the same would apply to, to any other company. If they want to spend the money on the marketing to get the cut through, they can do. Just because you operate a land-based casino does not mean you then wish to spend £60 million on TV advertising in the hope to, to take your percentage. 
But what about the value proposition? I'll get to you in a second. Sorry. The value proposition. Now, I think at Genting, you guys are allowing people to cash in and cash out at your cage for their online accounts. Is that, that correct? Absolutely, yeah. So, it, so it, it's, um, it, it's a unique selling point in, in essence that you can gamble online and you, you can cash out within the casino and, and, and vice versa. But it, it's, it's ancillary to the land-based operation. Um, it's a, yeah, it's ancillary to the yeah. land-based operation. It, it does seem, do you seem like you're butting heads against the land-based operations when you want to add something like that in? When you say a free hamburger for anyone that has an account or whatever it might be? No, it, as, exactly as Richard said, um, when, we, when we started this, there was, there was lots of resistance. Managers don't want to give their customers to online. So it, you start by um, by encouraging the managers so you know they, they the club can take a percentage of the if the customer plays online the the, the, the club can take a percentage. Um, the big cut through is, is really been getting the understanding our customers are playing online anyway. They are going to do that. So why wouldn't they do that with us? And why would you not encourage them to do that with us? Yeah. Uh, oh, I, I'll go Andrew, and then we'll go with uh, with Michael. Andrew. Well, um, I just wanted to experience in France. I'm on the board of a French uh, casino group, and we have um, we have online uh, betting. We used to have online poker, and we, we got out of online poker because we, that we couldn't pull liquidity. So we've only got 22 casinos. So our market was pretty small, and we we're up against two uh, big incumbents: the uh, Francaise des Jeux and the PNU. Um, but we have a betting business, and uh, our experience has been. Um, well, one, it loses money. Um, but that's changing because we're now changing the business model. The business model we're using is we're actually putting, um, we're testing this currently, is uh, sports bars in our venues. And we have now got, similar to what you're saying, is the management, that culture of actually this is good for your business because you're going to be driving people into the sports bars as opposed to this is something they can do somewhere else. So um, we're, we're now seeing our sign-ups are really increasing. What we're actually seeing is actually that the, the betting is much lower than the ones that we recruit, recruit online, but we're seeing them more frequently. So it's actually it, it's working its way through. But it's, we're leveraging our asset, our physical asset, to drive people in the online, in, on the online business as opposed to the other way around, which is to... to you know, the completely opposite mindset of what we talked about from yeah. the early 2000s. Michael, did you want to add anything? Yeah, yes, thank you. Um, before uh, Real Money Online became a reality in the U.S., we, we fully anticipated that it would grow the overall market and minimize cannibalization. And it, we've been surprised, frankly, by the uh, the data that has come in. And it's the surprise is to the upside. It's grown the market, frankly, more than we anticipated. And, and some of the data points that we've seen are ap absolutely uh Astounding, and I'm, I'm looking at New Jersey, where uh, where it's full blown online, and uh, we have some uh, some some good data from it. And Caesars, for example, uh, reports that 80 uh, percent of its online players are new customers, <laughs> i.e., they were they were not uh, enrolled in its total rewards program. And of those players in its total rewards database, 40 or more than 40 percent of those who played online had been inactive prior to the offering of online play, and then they reactivated. Uh, Tropicana, interesting, similar, 60% uh, of the players who signed on to play were, were new acquisitions. They were not in the, in the database. And of the, four, the, the remaining 40%, half of them had been inactive or lapsed. Uh, Golden Nugget in Atlantic City, 89% uh, of their players played online were, were new players and were not in their database. And interestingly, many, many of these new players are coming to the casino to uh, play in, in the physical facility and uh, are, are also spending money uh, in, in non-gaming areas and uh, essentially have uh, grown the, 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 the entire pie. And I should also point out that the, the question that was asked earlier about the, the regulatory related issues, and it was pointed out that certainly, uh, and I fully agree that uh, land-based operators are not going to risk their uh, enormous assets uh, on licensing related issues. But one of the things that we, we fundamentally believe is that the, the licensing issues that, and the, the licenses that 
uh, operators do hold, which are viewed as, as proof to the um, assets that they can leverage in the online sphere to send out a message that these games are 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 well run or and honest and, and all that goes with it. And and one last point that tied to uh, the earlier discussion, the the tax rate in New Jersey, the uh, the online tax rate is about twice the tax rate for land based. So that creates a significant incentive for operators to leverage their their online uh, database to get them on site because the that that difference the the tax rate is is in half that goes that drops straight to the bottom line and that is a significant incentive that's not going to be available in in multiple states where the tax rates in some jurisdictions can can approach on land based gaming can approach uh, fifty percent or more. So that's, but New Jersey, that's a little bit different because uh, New Jersey has a very low tax rate on its land-based play, of only eight percent. So that that creates that incentive to uh, to get them the, the online play into the land-based facilities. In some other jurisdictions, that that proposition may be entirely reversed. So we we've seen, yeah, you're you're discussing about the, you discussed the online, um, sorry the the. Terrestrial players converting to sorry the online players converting to terrestrial players um, and, and reviving the the stale databases by using the online proposition. But for those that are operating terrestrial casinos that are online, are you finding your online databases are providing you a, a good source of um, of customers, or are you finding it very difficult to convert from that database, or are you indeed finding that when you cross reference Customers you may have gotten from advertising elsewhere, you're getting them at that. They're getting those customers at a lower CPA because they already have interaction with your brand. So I guess I'm asking the opposite of what Michael's just saying, and asking you if the terrestrial database is converting well to the online player. Uh, let me have a go at that. Um, I, I guess if we track back a little bit, let's, let's think, think about market size. Um, if we go, go back a number of years. Um, and, and I'll, I'll come to your question, Michael, as, as I go this thought process, um, if I can keep my thoughts together. Um, so many, many years ago, UK casino industry um, was a fairly insular, I would say. Not a lot of people knew about it. We always used to moan about the penetration rates being less than 5%. I think we probably still do, um, but I think they're definitely higher than that. Um, and what happened was um, online came in, and poker being a prime example, um, people became aware that casino gaming in the UK was actually all right. It wasn't scary or horrible or anything like that. It was actually okay and a safe thing to do. Um, so we saw definitely saw growth in the market. We definitely saw more comfort with people playing um, poker, for example. Um, and the, you know, the way Michael's just described it in terms of the New, New Jersey experience um, is absolutely spot on. Um, so the, the migration between the two, um, what happened was, as we've gone forward, the, the Land -based, UK land-based casino industry has typically stuck to its guns to a large extent and then added bits on through white label deals, those sort of things. So I don't really know how to do that, so I'll put something on the side, I'll put something on the side. Um, I, I think now um, that, that, that fear of online is going to kill the world um, or, or kill the land-based industry is being used a little bit as an excuse. And, and operators, certainly in the UK, ought to have a complementary online presence to support their land-based operations uh, both ways both ways um, because if people are gambling people are gamblers they're, they're, they're probably gambling already either on an online portal or um, or in a land based casino or both um, pr probably um, more likely both I would suggest um, although I don't have any data to support that so somebody might shoot me down your claims on it. Um, it, it, it I think it's likely that um, the those Online operators who are currently playing with, say, let's say GVC, GVC, mm -hmm. very very well run company, um, very very <coughs> smart, very very smart guys, um, but that's all they offer, and I think I'll maybe come to Caesars a bit later on in the discussion, but you know if Caesars was running an online casino, people would feel more comfortable with that than they perhaps would do with the GVC because they would say, okay, look, I'm gambling with GVC, it seems to work fine, I get the cards, I generally trust it, etc., etc. But this is Caesars, and I know those guys, and I go down to five or eight of their casinos in the UK, um, 
So where's the migration going to happen? Caesars in the UK currently doesn't really have an online presence. So I see a migration happening from the pure online operators into those um, operators that have a trusted brand on the land-based side or a trusted brand full stop. You know, Sky, for example, Virgin, brands like that, I think people would trust as well. Um, but, but there's definitely, you would definitely see a crossover from online into the trusted brand model. Rank, rank to a lesser extent. I don't mean any disrespect to Rank as a brand. Rank is a good brand. People would, people would say, okay, I know Rank, I trust them. I know they have casinos called Grosvenor and all these sort of things. So that, that would seem more legitimate to me, not that GVC is not legitimate in any way, shape or form. Great operators. But there's just that bit more trust and solidity about it. <coughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's very true because of those brands you said. It is our, our core strength in terms of getting um, customers to go and play online. And I suppose a, a good example of that is John rightly says we haven't got the money to throw in billions on, onto advertising. But if you take the example of Mecca Bingo, um, slightly off message, but it's our other brand an incredibly well-known brand in, in retail customers, even for people who don't actually play with them. Everyone knows the Mecca Bingo brand has been around for uh, 50, 60 years. So consequently, when they're looking for a site, they decide to play online, as, as Mike absolutely rightly says, and you're looking down a list of, you know, again, no offense, maybe Joy Bingo or Foxy Bingos or whatever it might be, they've, they've heard of those, but there are an awful lot of other ones. But when you see Mecca, it's a, a name that they will recognise, and it's, it's that trust, is, as again Mike says, is very important. When you're going online, you're going to be giving over your card details and such like that. I think it does count for a lot. And so our Mecca site has been hugely more um, growth and success and, and, and uh, a crossover, and is one of the top online Mecca bingo brands without doing that much more than the, the casino. The casino one has struggled more because of the fact there are less casinos. It's, is a brand we all know, Grosvenor Casinos, but the people who've never been to a casino or whatever have never heard of it any more than they've heard of 888 or such like. So that's, that I think is quite important and, and it's what we certainly play on. So we've made you know, the online look and feel is identical to the look and feel of the casinos. The machine games are the same ones you can get in club or to make people feel comfortable. In fact, the biggest growth uh, area on the online casino is in fact the live game. Uh, which comes from, from, from Malta. You know, people, our customers who are used to that interaction, it gives them a bit of a taste of what they're used to from the comfort of their own home or sitting on the bus wherever they play. Um, but they still like it. And so we make, make the, sort of the online offer look and feel like the sort of casino experience in, in, um, that they would otherwise have. But the bit I mentioned earlier on, I mean, so we're not sure what the exact figure is now in terms of the number that they actually do play, but that's such a huge growth potential which is why so much focus is there. I mean, every online brand is clearly wants to grow its marketplace, but when you've got an untapped market of 40-odd percent of a couple of million people, um, that's a huge amount of people who are there for the taking that we can target and, and hopefully lure across to it. Um, you'll, you'll come to it sure later in terms of regulation. One of the biggest problems we've got, of course, is the law. Um, our friends, our friends from the Commission here, they, they, they only have to apply it, but the law was written on the basis that online gaming was a threat that any online terminal was a potential gaming machine, so it had to be forbidden from the confines of a casino premises. So we can market and um, say how fabulous our brand is and offer them all sorts of trinkets, but what we can't do is offer online gaming from inside our casino. They have to go outside and play it on the way home. And that's <coughs> quite tying your hands behind the back because that huge selling point of being able to say, it's great, have a look at it, play it. You can say, have a look at it, but don't you dare touch that. You know, you'll have my license. And it, it's a, a rather perverse um, operating culture. And we've obviously been working uh, with the Commission in the DCMS to get that change. But again, Mike, uh, in America's point in terms of tax, you know, the government would then be concerned that if we're putting people online, instead of a 50% tax, uh, washing wheat from America, 50% tax that we pay in London uh, in for casino play, as opposed to 15% uh, online, do they want to drive that marketplace online? A bit risky, not sure we want to do that. And so we, we face a lot of obstacles in terms of what we see as the common sense approach, which is to say, 
you know, online gaming should be permitted from a terminal inside the casino as much as anything else. It's not a slot machine, and we've had to have some quite fun discussions with Erica and the guys in the DCMS to try and perhaps make it a sort of category of machine that's a sort of, um, you know, and, and it's, it's sort of almost depressing to think that that's what you've got to do to get what is a very modern device that people can otherwise say, I'm not doing that, I'll go and sit and play on my phone in the bar on, on a, um, you know, online because we can't physically offer them a terminal or, or iPad on a stick or whatever to do it because the iPad or rather the iPhone was invented three months before the Act came in in 2007, I think almost 10 years ago this very day or so. Um, so there was no perception of that type of technology. So banning it from the casino is now rather meaningless because people are doing it whether they like it or not, but they're just doing it from their pocket. So um, it's, a, it's still an uphill battle, and I think we've, we've all got that struggle in terms of making a piece of ten-year-old legislation, which we always thought was going to be, you know, the great uh, hope for the future and being modern rather than the old 68 Act, and it's already so out of date in so many ways, it's actually very frightening in terms of the future of our industry. Can I, can I just come in there a little bit, Richard? Well, we're transitioning into a bit of a lobbying effort, Eric, mm. so apologies. <laughs> <laughs> apologies Never miss a chance. Never miss a chance. It's, it's really, when you think about online gaming, it, online gaming in, in a standalone form is not a natural human state, I don't think. You know, people don't generally prefer isolation to socialisation uh, as, as human beings. Um, so it's more natural, I think, I might get a reaction from the audience here, but it's more natural that humans will want to socialise in groups, and therefore casinos if they want to do gambling, for example, are a good place to do that because there are quite a number of people there. Bingo halls are a good place to do it because there are quite a few people there. Football matches are a good place to do it because there's quite a few people there. So being in larger groups is more a more natural human state. So why then, it's not a question for you, Erica, why then philosophically <laughs> um, is online product not permitted in a casino environment? Um, um, and I think it, for me, ignore the lobbying side of it. You know, it it's a question of time. You know, in time, what will a casino look like? It will have much more modern product that looks digital, looks modern, looks like the innovative online stuff that's there, but it will be in that sociable environment with food and beverage around it, with entertainment, all those sort of things, with human interaction. So I think that's where we're going. It's just a case of you know, how, how does the regulator manage or interpret the law and apply the law um, to keep up with that, recognising that humans are sociable creatures and that to do responsible gaming in a sensible environment that needs human interaction, etc., etc., etc. So apologies, Erica, for a bit of lobbying there. It may, the the stance makes no sense, but maybe the law just needs to catch up. So I'm speaking on behalf of our regulator here, I've always supported. I've always supported. <laughs> um, I, I believe the difficulty really is is with online. Of course, you have unlimited stakes and prizes. Um, you can use credit cards. So while, of course, it, it's not common sense that you can't offer online in a casino, to be able to do so, you would have to, to look at those other factors. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. So it's a much wider uh, issue. I, I, John, I totally agree. I think those are details in the great scheme of humanity. So uh, 10 years' time, I think casinos will look quite different. I think the regulator will be very comfortable with online product there. With those restrictions, you say, you know, are unlimited stakes and prizes a good idea? I don't know, probably not, or with some controls around it. Should credit exist in a market, well, provided it's correctly managed, then yes, why not? Um, Can I? Yes, please, please. <laughs> I'd love you to. Yeah, I, mean, I think the Commission and DCMS are painfully aware that the, the way that the legislation, the private legislation of trade, um, has not kept, kept up with technological development, which has just, just been so fast and so massive. Uh, and so the framework of the Act is a complete dichotomy between remote and non-remote. Mm. And I think when it's drafted, they just don't imagine how they would converge. Mm. And similarly, we've got um, an obsession with, with products. So <coughs> there are rules for casinos, there are rules for bingo, there are rules for betting. betting. And, and people don't gamble in that kind of silo manner. You know, we, you know, we're beginning to understand how much um, players do like a variety of products, they like to mix the online with the physical life, life stuff. Um, and so then, then that's even before you start thinking about different you know, new forms of payment and there are a whole load of things that we weren't imagined. And, but we are, we are constrained by the legislation. Um, so I think what we are trying to do is work with the industry and with, with DCS to see what can be done within the existing legislation 
what we can do by changing secondary legislation is it's easier to find time for secondary legislation to go through than, than to try and tackle the Act itself. After the election, things are slightly up in the air. I don't quite know uh, how things going to work out, but we, we are conscious that we can't just try and hold gambling in the 20th century. Uh, we have to <coughs> work out how to, how to move from the times, but very often we are limited by what the legislation says. We can't just ignore bits of the legislation that we all agree are inconvenient and unhelpful. And to, for what it's worth, Erica, I think I think the regulators actually doing a pretty good job because things are moving so fast, as you said. There's so many things to think about. Resources are constrained. You know, we, you know we've had a number of discussions. You've had a number of discussions with the industry. Um, it's you know, where will we be in 10, 20 years' time? And we said that 15. We said well, 15 years ago. We said what would a casino look like? And 15 years later, it was exactly the same. <laughs> um, I don't think that will be the case with the way technology is moving. So in 10 years' time, I think it will be quite different. I'd just like to say, I think. One of the, the issues is, is that you talk about the industry, and it's not an industry, it's actually four different industries, and they're regulated in different ways, as we're saying, in the silo approach. And the problem is that any relaxation in one area is seen as a threat by the other, by the others. And there yeah. is this internecine war that goes on um, quite publicly, which is not helpful. Um, you know, and so the, res the result is, is that. Uh, it's easier for politicians to just put their heads down and let the, let the industry war amongst itself as it is to actually make some progress on the So gambling is seen as, as toxic by all parties. Yeah. So it's, mm -hmm. yes, very it's hard so. to get politicians who are going to fight for, for anything. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Mike. Uh, Doug Mills from Cassidy. Um, I'm interested in the Cassidy Wire um, can, any of the, can any of this amalgamation of the industry come about when taxation is in such polar, uh, polar opposite positions? Uh, yes, I think. Um, I haven't really thought it through the, through the day. Um, so, it, so it exists already, clearly. Um, so online taxation is different from offline taxation. Um, wh what does it mean? Um, so if we have a, a land-based tax rate which is greater than an online tax rate and the business then creates two elements to that, does that create an advantage for the land-based operator because the higher margin business depending on the marketing reinvestment in online enables more to be done for the land base so they become complementary anyway. Um, so I think the simple answer is yes, they can. There's a more philosophical question is, should they be out of line? Um, and you know, if you look at the inputs into the land base model of um, the, the labor costs required, the bricks and mortar, the rent that's required, com contrast that with the online, where it's a, a pretty much an entirely variable marketing expense, the tax almost seems to be the wrong way around mm -hmm. to me. Well, y yes and no, except you're in the land based model, you traditionally you're provided, um, you're, you're part of a, a, a small group of people granted the license, whereas in the online model, um, you're competing with offshore operators who are operating at zero tax and therefore can offer better bonusing. Sure. So if you were taxed at 50%, you wouldn't be able to compete on an international online basis. But because it was a principal point, right. I agree, yeah, Mike. Sure. It was a principal yeah. point <laughs> rather than. But, but it's interesting. Mike, point. Mark was view um, is almost labour protectionism uh, in New, New Jersey by having um, higher taxation for online, so it's protecting the land-based business. Mm. Whereas, whereas in most of the international gambling business, it's the complete opposite that um, land-based ca carried a much heavier burden. Yeah, I think New Jersey. I'd like to just, just elaborate on that last point. Is that. Uh, as more and more states uh, come online, the, uh, you're not going to see the New Jersey model replicated. You're going to see a, a significantly lower tax rate for online than you will for land-based, simply because the land-based tax rates are already in place. They did not anticipate online. They were established purely for political purposes, not economic purposes. And consequently, it's going to be the reverse of the New Jersey model, where the uh, the online rate is going to have to be lower simply for economic pr uh, purposes and consequently uh, you're going to be in a situation where you may inadvertently create a situation where uh, land-based operators are going to seek a greater online play because the tax rate will be significantly lower 